Wow. I know I'm supposed to start talking now. Um, I'm waiting for you all to get back to your seats, but that's not why I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting because I want to soak it in for a second. Like even for me as a speaker, as I get invited here, I'm just really filled with, with gratitude uh, to be here with you guys tonight. I'm not a youth anymore, but I, I have the opportunity to come to places like this and even just standing back there watching you all worship, it ministers so deeply to me. You know, I really believe that the enemy shudders at the sight of you all worshiping. Like, I get chills because I know that there's something really significant going on right now. And it's not just a bunch of songs that you're singing. It's not just a bunch of words that you're saying. I really believe that change is happening right now. And uh, I just got here. I got here just a couple hours ago, and I heard that God's been doing some really, really good things. Can you make some noise if you believe that God has been doing some good things this week? I feel it, and, and I appreciate the fact that you're confirming that with me right now, but I feel it. I feel like the Holy Spirit has been moving, and I feel like something good has been happening. And, and I believe it because I know that for months ahead of time, there have been people who have been planning this week and who have been praying over this week. And I know that you have some caring adults in your life that are praying for you back at home. I know that you have some people that you might not even know, friends of friends who heard about what's going on this week and they've been praying for you. And I, and I get chills because I know that something good is happening right now. Change is happening. I, I'm not just saying this for the sake of saying it either. I really believe that something good is going to emerge from this week. And I really believe that the enemy shudders at what's going on because good things happen when people open themselves up to what God wants to do. And I, I believe that none of you are here by mistake. I think God handpicked each one of you to be here this week. And so I know that people have been praying for you all week, but I really, really have been praying that you all would have ears to hear and eyes to see and that your hearts would be ready to receive. And because you've met with God this week, I hope that you will leave changed. I had a friend who asked me a long time ago, I went to a youth camp like this once when I was young, and, and he said, hey, how was the week? How was your week at camp? And I said, it was good. And then he followed up with a question, he said, well, well, how did you change as a result? Because he said, because if you can't pinpoint ways in which you've changed or ways in which you want to change, well, what was, what was good about it? What was good about it if, if you didn't leave changed? And so the question that I pose to you right, right off the bat, right as we start tonight, is, is how have you opened yourself up to be changed by God this week? Tonight, we're going to talk about what it looks like to grow, what it looks like specifically to grow in mercy and in forgiveness. And forgiveness is a really hard thing to do. We all say that forgiveness is a beautiful thing when we see it from a distance, and forgiveness is beautiful until it's time to actually have to do it. Forgiveness is a really tough thing to do, but when you meet with God, and you have an experience with God, God will change you and God will empower you to do even hard things like extend mercy and forgiveness. I wonder if this week you're ready to go home changed. I wonder if this week you'll be ready to go home and extend forgiveness to some people. This is the challenge right off the bat. You know, I really believe that as we look into the word tonight, as we've looked into the word all this week, it's a powerful thing that happens whenever we open up this word. Because this word right here, the truth that's in the word, has the power to change you. It will equip you, empower you, and guide you more than any other truth in this world. This is the truth. And so something powerful happens when we open up the word of truth. Along with the word community is really important too. So even if you're an introvert and you like being alone, and this week has been a challenge because you've been around a lot of people and it's been a little bit exhausting, I want you to pause and soak it in. 
Look around the room. And I hope that for a moment you'll be filled with gratitude for the people that God has put around you because community is a gift. The word along with community will change you, guide you, and empower you more than anything else. And I hope that even as you leave this week, as some of you have formed some really deep friendships, I hope that even beyond this week, as you guys go back to your home churches and your cities, that, that you'll, you'll like each other so much that you'll start inviting each other into your spaces outside of church. I hope that you'll look forward to every time you get together as a youth group. I hope that you guys might even start crashing some dinners at each other's houses. I hope, I mean, and I'm giving you permission to do this, start inviting yourself over to your friends' houses. Um, you know, as a parent, I'd say that if you came home from camp and you made some really deep friendships and you started inviting your friends over, I'd, I'd be down for that. I'd be excited about that. I'd even say, you know what, you can even invite your youth pastor too. Let's just make it a party. Come on. Oh, man. Okay. So I see some, some heads shaking right here. I was a youth pastor for like 10 years. That kind of hurts my heart. Um, Okay, speaking of inviting your youth pastor over for dinner, I have, a, I have a story about that. I have a youth pastor friend who told me this crazy story about this one time that he had dinner over at the home of one of uh, the families at his church. And, you know, they had a great time together. They made a meal for him, um, and they played some games, and they spent some good time getting to know, it, know each other. But after he left, this crazy thing happened. After he left, um, the mom turns to the kids and she says, you know what, I know this sounds kind of crazy, but... I think your youth pastor stole my spoon. And, you know, the kids are like, Why, what would he steal your spoon for? And she's like, no, I, I really think he stole our spoon, or that one particular spoon that I really hold dear to my heart. And, and he didn't know this, but for an entire year, this woman held a grudge against him. She thought, this youth pastor stole my spoon. I don't know what's wrong with him. Um, so a year goes by. And they invite him over for dinner once again. And she, she had said throughout the year, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to be the bigger person. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to hold it against him. But as they were having dinner, she couldn't help herself. She just blurted it out. She said, Pastor, listen, did you steal our spoon last year? And the pastor replied, oh, no, I didn't steal it. I put it in your Bible. Oh, do you get it? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Uh, that was a joke, by the way. That didn't actually really happen. Um, don't worry. Your youth pastors are not out to get you. They're not setting you up for entrapment. They're not checking to see if you're reading your Bible every day or every year. But I do hope. I, I, I gave you that story because I do hope that it won't take another year before you crack this thing open. I hope that the word of truth will go with you, guide you, change you and empower you. Um, on that note, can I just stop and pray before we open up the word? God, we know that you've already met us here. You're here. You're inviting us in to go deeper with you. And so again, God, a lot of us have already been praying. Lord, open up our eyes to your truth. Open up our ears to your truth. Let our hearts be fertile soil and give us the courage and the confidence to act on the change that you're doing in our hearts. May everything that we do be unto your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's funny that this week the theme would be broadcast. Uh, back when I was around the age of some of you, if you asked me what I wanted to do after college, I would have told you I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to broadcast the news. Um, and remember, this was decades ago, before the days of TikTok and IG and, and when everybody had their own YouTube channel. Not everyone could report on whatever they wanted to and have their own channel about it back then. But if you asked why I, um, a young Korean girl from Canada, wanted to be a journalist, I think it was because looking back, the only person that I remember seeing on TV who looked like me was a woman named Connie Chung. This was way back in the day. Connie Chung, she's an OG. She was a journalist and she was the only person that I remember who looked like me, an Asian woman who, who wasn't some sort of caricature. She, didn't, she wasn't a kung fu character. She didn't have a thick, heavy accent. Um, back when I was growing up, 
We didn't have BTS or Blackpink. Uh, people didn't know what K-pop was if you weren't Korean. Uh, they didn't have K-beauty sections in Target. You know, I had a kid in the first grade tell me that Korean people weren't even a real thing. <laughs> he asked me if I was Chinese or Japanese, and when I told him I was Korean, he said, no, you're not. There's no such thing. So this is the era that I grew up in. And so imagine me being able to see someone like Connie Chung on TV. And I think I wanted to be a journalist because she gave me a vision of what could be. She gave me a vision for what was possible. Now, I did major in communications and sociology in college, thinking that I'd pursue journalism. But God had something else in mind for me. And so today, as a pastor and a preacher, you could say that I'm still broadcasting news. I'm just broadcasting a different kind of news. Uh, news that doesn't change moment by moment, but good news that can change, change lives for eternity. And good news about a God who does not change. Um, you all heard from some amazing speakers this week. Actually, the speakers that you heard from each night are some of my favorite preachers. Um, I have the privilege of calling these preachers friends and coworkers. You heard from Pastor Ephraim on night one. And you heard from my girl Luma on night two. And you heard from my friend Steve yesterday. And I know that each of them preached truth that will probably impact you for a lifetime because they preach the word of truth. You've had the privilege of being led in worship all throughout this week. And I'm sorry I didn't, I can't remember everybody's name here, but I, I, I know uh, Tanya, when she gets up here, when Miss Tanya gets up here and she, she sings her heart out, she, she unleashes an, an, an anointing. Like she, she invites you in to worship the way that she worships and communes with God. Um, I, I know that Melinda was here yesterday and the day before. And, and I know that the way that she worships, she worships in freedom and, and she worship, worships in truth. And, and I hope that there was a, a bit of a, a, a holy wonder in you if you've never experienced worship that way before you. I hope that, that if you've never had an experience where you can really get lost in worship, where you've forgotten about the people around you and, and it's become a moment where it's just you and God, I hope that you won't leave this week without allowing yourself to get in the presence of God and just really worship. Because something happens in those moments where you can really worship God. Change happens in your heart. Change happens in your heart and something good will happen as a result of that change. I also hope that throughout this week you've heard a lot of things that don't just sound like good news, but I hope that you've felt like the good news have, has permeated into your heart and in your spirit. I hope that good seed has taken root in your heart and good seed has fallen on good soil. And I hope that when you go home from this week, when people ask you, how was your time at Unite? You can tell them it was good because you met with a good God and that good God did something to change something inside of you. So I know we're just getting started here, but we're on day four. And I want to make sure that we don't leave without asking the question, have I really allowed the goodness of God to change me this week? Or am I going to leave unchanged? I hope that doesn't happen. The seed that has been scattered and planted and watered and tilled and cared for, I hope that even as you leave, you will stay committed to growing. I hope you won't leave the same as when you, as when you came. I hope that years from now, 10, 20, 30 years from now, you'll be able to look back on this summer and you'll remember all that happened here and you'll be reminded of the goodness of God. You know, experiences like this matter because if you let them, they will change you for good. And let me tell you, God wants to do so much good through you. you know, tonight we're gonna read a parable about a guy who had an experience that should have changed him for good, but turns out it didn't. So we're gonna read from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. And depending on your translation, this is called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Or in some translations, it's, it's the parable of the unmerciful servant. I'm also going to give you an extra title. I, I would say that this is the parable of the unchanged servant. The servant who was not willing to grow. And so it starts like this. 
Then Peter approached him. Who did Peter approach? He approached, he approached Jesus. Peter approached Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything that he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him and forgave him the loan. The servant went out and found and found one of his fellow servants who owned, owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and he said, pay me what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down, and he began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and he threw him into prison until he could pay what he was owed. Now, when the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed, and they went and reported their, to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you and all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have also showed mercy on your fellow servant as I showed mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that he was owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives your brother or sister from your heart. Woo. I'm glad that you can clap at that. I am glad that you can clap at that because this is a hard word to follow. It's good news. It's good news because we have all been forgiven like this one who owed his master. But it's a hard word to follow because Jesus said, now the same is required of you. If you have been forgiven much, so you will be required to forgive another. Now by now you know that Jesus used parables to teach about the kingdom of God. And he used parables to help us understand who God is and who we are in relation to God as well. Um, so, so the parables, they use all these metaphors and examples. And in case you missed it, God is the merciful, generous, and forgiving king who had compassion and released and forgave the servant who had a huge debt owed to him. In this parable, Jesus uses an exaggerated amount of money as his example. He says 10,000 talents were owed to the master. Now in today's money, uh, the equivalent of 10,000 talents would be trillions and trillions of dollars, gazillions of dollars, money that we can't count. It's an insurmountable amount of money. It's like if you put all the money that Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, and, and Elon Musk, the Tesla guy, if you put all their money together, you'd still have trouble putting, paying off this debt. This is how big the debt that was owed to the master was. Now, this guy owed the king this much money, and the money that he was owed was about the equivalent of a double-double at In-N-Out. <laughs> Like you, you can't even get, okay, you're excited about a double double, but you can't even get a milkshake or fries with that. Okay, that's how little the amount was. He owed all of this money to the king and he was forgiven, yet he couldn't forgive the amount of a double double that his coworker owed him. Now you listen to this story and you think, how dare this servant have the nerve to be so unmerciful after so much mercy was shown him? Had he learned nothing? How has he not changed? We can look at the story and we can say, I don't get it. How did this man remain unchanged when something amazing had happened to him? In this story, we, we see a show of, of crazy ungratefulness. And we see a show of un, an unfathomable, unfathomable amount of mercy and forgiveness. And though most of us can read this story and we think that it's crazy that this guy who owed so much money could remain so unchanged, sometimes we can be just like this guy too. You know, if we can see ourselves in the shoes of this first servant who owed the king a huge debt, we can get a picture of the debt that we owe God. 
God's holiness is so out of reach for us that the gap between us, the gap between us and the perfection of God is like the trillions and trillions of dollars that are owed to God. You know, and as hard as you may try, God's perfection is simply out of reach for us. We can't do our way out of good graces into God's mercy. We can't, we can't earn our good graces. We can't earn our salvation. We can't earn forgiveness from God because anything that we do is not going to measure up to the holiness and perfection of God. And this is the debt that we owe to Jesus because Jesus stood in our place. We went from being condemned to a life sentence for generations to set free and made new because of Jesus. Jesus did die once and for all. But if we hear it, if we know it, if we get preached these words, if we read these words in the Bible, if we have an experience with God and we remain unchanged, we are like this unforgiving servant. How can we leave unchanged after knowing of the goodness of God, after hearing of the goodness of God? After understanding, knowing it in our brains, how can our hearts remain unchanged? How can we stay the same? We have no excuse. And when you give your life to Jesus, the only debt that you have left to pay to God, to pay to God is to grow in his goodness and his likeness. You can't stay the same. Some of you might remember in 2018, there was a story about a police officer named Amber Geiger. She was a white woman who shot and killed uh, a man named Botham John. He was a young 26-year-old black man who was killed while sitting in his own apartment eating ice cream. She said that when she entered the apartment, she thought the apartment was her own. She lived one floor down. But when she opened the door and she saw this black man sitting there eating ice cream, she claimed to have believed him to be a burglar. And she said that she feared for her life. So she took out a gun and shot him in a moment while he sat eating ice cream. Now there was widespread media attention about this case, especially because the American justice system has a reputation for not upholding justice for black people killed at the hands of officers. In this case, justice would have been impossible because Botham John was dead. And the best that could have been hoped for was a strong decision that called for accountability. In the end, Geiger did get charged with 10 years in prison. But it felt like a, a slap on the wrist. It felt like a slap on the wrist to many people. And, and during her trial, evidence of racist texts exchanged between her and some of her colleagues did not help garner any sympathy from the public. But at her sentencing, she was allowed to address some words to Botham John's family. She apologized to them tearfully. She expressed remorse and sorrow. And then, Botham's brother, Botham's brother Brant, he took the stand. And later he would say that none of these words that he said were planned prior to him taking the stand. As he sat before the court, looking straight into the face of the person who took the life of his beloved brother, he said, I forgive you. I don't hate you. I actually don't even wish any harm upon you. And in words that sound incredulous to people who heard it, he said, I actually love you. And he said it again, I forgive you. I don't even want you to have to go to jail. And then he stood up and he hugged her. And then the internet went wild. People weighed in with all sorts of opinions as to why or wh why not he shouldn't have forgiven her. People said, man, he shouldn't have stood up and hugged her. And I'm not going to discount any of those feelings either. There has been a long history of injustice and harm, particularly against the African-American community. And, and there has repeatedly been an expectation that the black community would overlook or get over these injustices when justice has not been served. See, asking for accountability is okay. Taking time to grieve and lament and even be angry is okay. Taking time to heal is okay. And we don't need to skip ahead to forgive and forget. Because sometimes we won't ever forget. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can forgive. You know, Brant did not give a lot of interviews after this event. He didn't want a media frenzy around him and his family. He said he didn't do this for media attention. 
He didn't do this because he wanted to bear witness to Christ. He, he said he, he didn't do this because he wanted the public to see. He did this because he, he felt compelled to do this. And, and for people who can read between the lines, people who might share the same faith as him, they might, they might say, you know what, I think, I think Brant had a Holy Spirit experience in this moment. He did what was impossible for man. He forgave the person who took the life of his brother. He said, I love you, and he hugged her. This sounds ludicrous to people who do not know the love and the power of Christ. He hugged her. He said, I forgive you. And he said this, the only thing that I want for you the only thing that I want, and I want this because I know that this is what my brother Botham would want for you, is for you to give your life to Christ. He said, if you go to Jesus, I know that he'll forgive you. And then he hugged her as the word, world watched on. Now, can you imagine after this if Geiger remained unchanged? What if after this she said, well, whatever. I didn't really even need forgiveness. I did nothing wrong. <laughs> When I get out of jail, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to being a cop. In fact, I'm going to be on a special task force that arrests people who wrongfully trespass. I mean, there could be um, so many wacky possibilities of what kind of twisted ways in which this could go if her heart was not changed. The outrage would be off the charts, and we'd all say that she was totally undeserving of that beautiful gesture of forgiveness. She'd be just like the unforgiving servant in this parable. But even if in this worst possible scenario, if Amber Geiger, when she leaves jail, if she is unchanged and she came out unrepentant and wicked, for Brant's sake, we'd hope that he wouldn't have to be burdened with the weight of unforgiveness and anger and bitterness anymore. I'm glad that that forgiveness happened, even if she never changes, because that act of forgiveness may have been more for him than it was for her. Do you know that unforgiveness can eat away at your insides? Unforgiveness can fill you with bitterness and anger and it can paralyze you. It can paralyze you from the good things that God has in store for you. Even if something bad has happened to you, even if, if you weren't deserving of it, and I know that many of you have a story like that. Many of you have, have stories of trauma and abuse and, and you didn't deserve that. Those things were not your fault. But I want to say this. If you hang on to unforgiveness, there is more that the enemy wants to do to twist that and take away from you than you know. And it is an act of God, a, a grace of the Holy Spirit for you to be able to release forgiveness to the person who has offended and hurt you. It is an act of grace of God for you to let it go. You know, what's funny about this passage on forgiveness is that, like us, Peter starts off asking, asking Jesus questions about himself, thinking that he knew a thing or two about life. Um, Peter, Peter may have had a level of uh, unself-awareness going on. At the beginning of this passage, Peter goes up to Jesus and he says, well, Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? And this number didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, it's said that rabbis would teach that, that in any given day, uh, you, you, you were not required to forgive anyone more than three times. So if somebody commits an offense against you and you forgive them and you forgive them and you forgive them again, well, by the fourth time, it's, oh, well, you're on your own. I forgave you one, more, one too many times and you're on your, no, on your own. I am not obligated to forgive you anymore. And so when Peter says to Jesus, am I, am I to forgive seven times? It's almost as if he's, he's flexing on Jesus a little bit. He's showing off and he's saying, you know, I'm going to go above and beyond those three times. I'm going to double that and add one for good measure. Jesus, am I a good person if I forgive somebody seven times? And Jesus says, no, you, you're not getting the point. He goes on to explain it a little bit more later on. But if you back up even more to the beginning of Matthew 18, at the beginning of Matthew 18, a group of disciples, I bet Peter was in the mix too, they go up to Jesus and they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But like many things in God's economy, what you think is right or what you think is valuable is not the same to Jesus. 
Jesus taught things like, to be the greatest, you actually have to become the least. To become great, you have to become a servant to all. To become great, you have to become like a child. And here's where the unforgiving servant couldn't understand the upside down nature of God. Here's where the unforgiving servant missed it. Here's where Peter was not full in his understanding yet. To be great in the kingdom of God is not to be one who has lots of money, or, or exerts power and control over people. To be great in the kingdom of God is to be one who is generous, merciful, merciful and forgiving. To be generous, merciful, and forgiving, one has to know that they have been given much, shown much mercy, and forgiven much too. See, this unforgiving servant didn't change. He didn't grow because he failed to understand just how much he was giving. This morning, I asked my four-year-old child to grab something off the counter and throw it in the garbage. Um, I, don't even knew if, I, I don't even know if this kid knew what he was saying. Um, but the timing of it was crazy, too, because it's almost like he knew I needed a sermon illustration. So I, I, I told him, hey, can you, MJ, can you take that garbage and throw it in the, in the garbage for mommy? And he turns to me and he says, mm, I'm not your servant. Where did he even learn this, right? And, and in that moment, I almost laughed, um, but I didn't. And, and I almost gave him a lecture telling him, well, you do not know what your mother has done for you. How dare you say to me, am, am I your servant? Your mother carried you in her womb for nine months, nursed you, changed you, nursed you, changed you, nursed you, changed you. All throughout COVID gave you all the snacks, gave you all those toys. And I almost went off on this little four-year-old boy. But... But I gave him grace because he's four and he's adorable and he doesn't know any better yet. Maybe I'll give him till he's five. <laughs> but you know, Peter, when he was, he was kind of showing off in front of Jesus, saying that he could forgive someone up to seven times, he was also saying this because he just didn't know any better yet. Jesus said, I'm not asking you to forgive someone seven times. He said, try forgiving 70 times seven. Even then, he didn't even mean it literally. He said this to illustrate that whatever you had in your mind, however many times you think you have to forgive somebody, multiply that number because it's too, e it's too big to even count. And it's, it, the point is not how many times you forgive a person. It's the why and the how. You can't do it on your own strength. I'm going to show you how. And I'm going to show you why you need forgiveness. And because of that, you're going to be changed. Peter was known as one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he's the one who Jesus named Cephas, which means the rock. Jesus believed in Peter so much that he said, your name is the rock and on this rock I am going to build my church. And Jesus called him the rock even though he knew that Peter was going to fail in a really, really big way. Jesus called him the rock and he said, I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter, even though he knew that in the future, Peter was going to betray him in a really, really painful way. Peter was going to experience forgiveness and redemption in a way that he never would if Peter stayed thinking that he was big stuff for being willing to forgive someone seven times. If you don't know the story, on the night that Jesus was arrested, the disciples who had faithfully followed Jesus for three years, they deserted him when the going got tough. Out of fear, they fled. And Peter, who was the self-proclaimed most down disciple for Jesus, denied even ever knowing Jesus. Jesus predicted this. He said, Peter, I know you say that you're never going to leave me, you're never going to betray me. But before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And sure enough, that night, after Peter was asked for the third time if he knew Jesus, after angrily cursing and shouting, I don't know the man, the rooster crowed. And when Peter did the very thing that he said he would never do, he wept bitterly, knowing that he had betrayed someone he said he was willing to give his life up for. And after that, Jesus was tortured and mocked and hung on the cross. Can you imagine the amount of shame and regret that Peter felt that night? He said he'd never do it. He was sure he would never deny Jesus or, or desert him. But he did it three times, and now Jesus was dead. How do you bounce back from something like that? You can't. Not by yourself. 
And so the good news is that Jesus didn't leave Peter to do it on his own. Here's the full circle moment for Peter. Peter had failed in a really, really big way, and he felt like he wasn't deserving of forgiveness. Peter said he would never deny Jesus. And one of my favorite moments in the Bible is when Jesus sits down with Peter and he extends forgiveness to him. Not only does he extend forgiveness to him, he releases him into his calling. So I know I'm going over time here, but if you would quickly let me just tell this story here. Picture it with me, okay? Peter and Jesus are sitting by the fire. Jesus hung on the cross, he died, but he resurrected from the grave. And, and he came back to life, and, and he came back to life, and he was about to go back up to heaven, proving that he was who he said he was. He was God, he said, he said I'm gonna go to the cross, but I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna conquer sin and death. But before he left, he took the time to linger with some of his people, and he lingered with Peter. He sat by a fire. And in John 21, there's this one picture where Jesus is sitting with Peter, and they're sitting by a fire over hot coals. And this is important because the only other time that you read in scripture of a fire being described in that way is when Peter is warming his hands over the fire when he denied Jesus. He's warming his hands over a fire of hot coals when people say, weren't you with that man? And he denies Jesus three times. And then Jesus, days later, comes back to meet Peter in a place that would be really familiar to him. See, what Jesus was doing is he was bringing Peter back to a place of pain. He's recognizing, Peter, I know that you have shame and you have guilt and you have regret over this moment, but I'm gonna sit with you in that place and I'm gonna make you face it with me. And then Jesus asked Peter three times, he says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. And, Peter, and, and Jesus asked Peter again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. And, and sometimes people might read this passage thinking that, that Jesus was requiring Peter to say I love you for every time that he denied him, as if this would make up for him denying Jesus in the first place. But really what's happening is Jesus is wanting Peter to really recognize who he was. Because there was power in Peter being able to proclaim yes, Jesus, I love you. You know that I love you. Peter needed to say it three times so that he would believe that he was worthy to be called a shepherd because every time that he said, I love you, Jesus said to him, well, then I have a job for you. I need you to change. Don't stay locked into your guilt and your shame. I forgive you and I have a new calling for you. I have a new calling for you. I want you to go and feed my sheep. I want you to go and take care of my lambs. Peter, I love you so much that I want to release you from the unforgiveness that you are feeling over yourself right now. I want to release you from the shame and the guilt that you are feeling right now. And I want you to change knowing that I have a higher calling and a higher purpose for you. There is a word in here for each of you tonight. And right now, I know I'm over time, so I'm going to get off the stage, but you're going to be led in a really meaningful exercise. And before we go into that exercise, I just want to pray over you. Will you do that with me? Will you let me pray? Lord, I know that there are brothers and sisters in this room tonight who need to be released of some things that have been grabbing a hold of their heart. Maybe there are people here tonight who have been struggling with unforgiveness over themselves. Maybe there are people here tonight who have been struggling with letting go of anger and bitterness because of something that was done to them and they need to experience the freedom of forgiveness. And so Holy Spirit, we just invite you right now. We're willing, Lord, to be changed by you. So you, good God, would you have your way in us and empower us to be changed tonight by your goodness and your grace. Release your forgiveness over us tonight, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.